If you want to be great at sprinting, you have to sprint a lot. Sprinting has been shown repeatedly to improve our ability to sprint, like in this study, which stated that sprinting has been shown to improve sprint performance in athletes. But sprinting doesn't mean going out and running lots of repetitions at 70, 80, or 90% effort. If you want to improve your maximum speed, you have to run all out. As the great high school coach Tony Holler would say, you have to be fresh, in spikes, and getting your times recorded in order to make sure you're giving your maximum effort on every single rep. Training like this is highly taxing for your nervous system and can take a lot out of you, so we have to put a lot of thought into our sprinting volume. On top of that, on any given day, as soon as we start feeling fatigue, we are no longer training maximum speed. Pushing through tiredness instead trains endurance, and while that is an extremely important quality for some athletes to develop, it is not the same thing as max speed. And in my opinion, it should not be the priority of most of our training, but is instead something to incorporate later in the season, close to competition, if at all. Now, speed itself is so important because it is the key performance indicator for every track event from the 60 to the 800. Even if you're not specifically a track athlete, speed is still one of the biggest factors that distinguishes average athletes from great ones. Being smart and strategic is great and undeniably important, but if you can beat anyone down the court or the field, then the need for decision making and sports skills is reduced because there are less people around that you need to outsmart or outskill, simply because they can't keep up with you. Hopefully that makes it clear why developing maximum speed should be the number one priority of almost every single athlete, and why max speed work should be as close to zero fatigue as possible with very long rests and reps that are very, very short. However, regular sprinting isn't the only kind that we should focus on. There is another type of sprinting that is crucial for speed development, and that is resisted sprinting. Resisted sprinting can be done in multiple ways, but it is most commonly performed with resistance from a sled or by a partner. Just make sure your partner is actually strong enough to resist you. Just like in lifting where we perform movements with a weight in order to provide a specific stimulus to our muscles, resisted sprinting allows us to overload the actual sprint movement in one of the most directly applicable ways possible. They are particularly good at improving the ability to accelerate by teaching athletes how to produce horizontal forces, which are the primary forces required for acceleration. Studies like this one have shown that sprint training combined with resisted sprint training created a greater improvement in 10 and 30 meter sprint times than sprinting alone did. Another study showed that eight weeks of resisted sprint training produced significant improvements in acceleration performance. Just like with regular sprint training, if speed is our number one priority, which it should be, then we want to keep resisted sprint reps extremely short with maximum effort and long rest in between. In terms of how much resistance we should actually use, opinions seem to vary strongly, with some people suggesting you should never go above 10% of your body weight because it will interfere too much with your mechanics. In contrast with that perspective, one study showed that resisted sprints with 40% of body weight improved unresisted sprinting performance. A different study showed that while resisted sprints with 80% of body weight did not improve sprint performance, resisted sprints with 12.5% of your body weight did. Looking at this evidence, I think a safe range would be resisted sprints loaded between 5 and 50% of your body weight for optimal improvements in acceleration and sprint speed. If this video has been helpful to you so far, make sure to share it with a friend so they can learn along with you. Alright, we've covered that sprinting is great and very important in all different forms. But what can we do other than sprinting to get faster? There is one thing that's in competition with actual sprinting for being the most important form of training, not just for speed, but for all around athleticism and explosiveness. And that thing is plyometrics. Plyometrics are movements that include a rapid storage and then release of energy in your tendons and muscles through the stretch shortening cycle. This could include movements such as pogo hops, depth jumps, or even sprinting itself. A regular standing jump, while it is a great movement for your rate of force development and concentric power production, is not a plyometric because it does not include the rapid stretching prior to the shortening. Speaking of rate of force development, that is one of the big benefits to plyometric training. It teaches your body how to produce forces very quickly, which is endlessly important for athleticism. There's a reason that most guys who are really good at jumping, bouncing, or just plyometrics in general are usually very fast. They can store force in their tendons and muscles well, maintain leg stiffness, and produce force insanely quickly. Plyometrics are also heavily supported by science. A meta-analysis from 2012 looking at 26 different studies showed that 10 and 100 meter sprint times were improved significantly from the implementation of sprint-specific plyometric exercises. They also showed that exercises with a higher plyometric loading lead to greater improvements in sprint performance. Depth jumps are a great example of a highly loaded plyometric that is very intense. However, I would strongly recommend against starting with these if you aren't already well-trained in plyometric activities. Spikes in workload and intensity have been shown to increase the risk of injury, so just like with anything else, you have to start at a low level and slowly work yourself up over time. In the beginning, extensive plyometrics are a great place to start. These are higher volume, lower intensity exercises that expose your muscles and tendons to low level spring forces so that you can begin to adapt and adjust to them without the high risk for injury. 
At first, you can slowly increase the volume of these, and then later on you can reduce the volume and begin increasing the intensity. With a slow, steady transition period, you can then begin intensive plyometrics, which are exercises like drop jumps that are maximum effort and very high intensity, and will have the biggest impact on your sprinting performance. Movements like these, when programmed correctly, may even increase the amount of fast twitch muscle fibers that you have. I do want to make a whole video completely focused on the development of fast twitch muscle fibers, so if that's something you're interested in, make sure to subscribe. And speaking of muscle, lifting is the fourth key science-based thing you have to do to maximize your speed development. Everyone knows that lifting can make you stronger and help you build muscle, but how does that help you get faster? Speed boils down to a super simple equation, stride length times stride frequency. Stride length isn't a result of how far you stretch out your legs in your running, but instead it's a result of how much force you can put into the ground and how quickly you can put that force into the ground. The more force you apply into the ground, the further you'll be displaced with each step. That is why Usain Bolt can run the 100 meters with only about 41 steps compared to his competition who take around 44 to 45 steps. He produces way more force into the ground and so each step propels him further. So, if you can increase the maximum amount of force you can produce, you will most likely be able to put more force into the ground, travel further with each step, and therefore run faster. Tons of studies have backed this up, like this meta-analysis, which found a significant correlation between back squat and 20 to 40 meter sprint times. In fact, they said that the greater the improvement in back squat strength, the greater the sprint speed improvement. In terms of other specific exercises, sets, and reps, I can make a whole video on what the science shows is the most effective protocol. If that's something you want to see, let me know in the comments. Until then, remember to learn, train, and dominate.